everybody. Welcome to the WWDNYK studios. This is Dr. Jack talking to you live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest is a constant thinker. It's really apparent that this man's mind never stops analyzing, weighing, comparing, and thinking. He's been living in my head rent-free for about a week and a half, and I've searched for points of disagreement. To, and to tell you the truth, I can't find many. I, I ran into him online in a 2015 lecture on, a freedom of, on the topic of freedom of speech. I really recommend it. He is a consummate objectivist who does not like paying for maternity insurance unless he needs it. He believes coercion is the enemy of reason. I invited him on Unbreaking Science because, in my opinion, his message is an important message for our times, for the moderates and for the people who are extremists who really need to move to the middle. Uh, when I listen to many people speak, uh, they write on social media, they write in the journals, whatever they're writing, uh, they often take positions and they make arguments that are either, uh, you know, make them fall, in, in my mind, into the object, objectivist camp, but they don't know it. They, they, they may think that they're either left or right, sometimes based on a few deal-breaker issues. Uh, you know, I recently published an article saying that we have to disempower those who gain by keeping us apart. And two days later, I heard Yaron Brook uh, say he doesn't like the left or the right. In fact, he wants a pox on both of their houses. Uh, so it's my hope that my immediate and broader community and indeed the public at large can come to know how to think about epistemology, how to think about thinking and metacognition. Uh, uh, I keep hitting the microphone. I need to stop doing that. At, at first, you might think he's fallen off the ladder of reason. It depends on where you are in the political spectrum or something. But once you hear him out, it's very difficult to find points of disagreement. He's host of the podcast, The Yaron Brook Show, director of the Ayn Rand Institute and author of many books, including Equal is Unfair, co-authored by Don Watkins. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yaron Brooks. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Right on. So uh, I've got a couple questions that we can get started, right? So to be an objectivist, you do agree one first has to be a realist, right? Well, I mean, we have to be careful about definitions, right? Uh, so what does it mean to be a realist? Uh, if you mean adhere to reality, accept the independent existence of uh, reality, of uh, the material world out there, then yes, absolutely. Uh, you have to be connected to facts, to reality. A is A. Things are what they are. Your wishes don't make it so. There is no meta-consciousness out there manipulating things based on whim and... Uh, and desires it is reality is what it is and uh we have the tool to know it and that tool is is our reason yeah we're absolutely in a battle for um a reality i think it's like a, an existentialist you know there, there's there's the constructivist that people think you can create realities um and then there's the just the, the empiricist who you know we go out and we discover reality of certain certainly you can make your own reality that's not what i'm saying but um if if they're on this metacognition thing, you've said a couple of times. I've I've, I've heard you say that um, you know th there is no collective consciousness. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I want to get to you uh, get 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 with you on this here is social media has changed everything. There seems to me an emergence of a new. I won't use the word collective consciousness because I don't think we have a vocabulary term for it. But there's a new intelligentsia by which people can become aware through the collective awareness, and I don't mean this in a mystical sense, but the collective perception of facts, trends, figures, you know, things happening, events. Uh, it, would that be a collective consciousness? So, simply because it's not inside the brain of the human being? Can't, can't we have a physical consciousness that's beyond humans? Well, but then, then it's our consciousness, right? Only individuals can have consciousness. Consciousness is awareness. It's awareness of reality. It's awareness of what's outside of us, and to some extent, awareness of our own, uh, uh, you know, our introspection, our own processes. Um, so you can't have a collective consciousness any more than you can have a collective stomach, any more than somebody else can eat for you, nobody else can think for you. And I don't think that social media is completely different than anything else. I, I think what social media does is it magnifies existing processes and existing realities. We've had madness of crowds, madness of crowds forever. 
uh, it, you know, television was was blamed for every social ill possible uh, when it was first launched, you know, in the in, in late in the 50s and 60s. You remember the movie Network? I don't know if you ever saw the movie Network, where, where television, you know, wild everybody up this television host. Um, so uh, social media is just a faster, uh, shallower means of communication that creates more hype and creates more madnesses of crowds faster mm. and quicker and bigger because it now now we have 8 billion people on the planet connected as compared to in the past when networks were much smaller. But it's not a change in kind. It's a change in magnitude and speed rather than in kind. No, it's still your responsibility as an individual to do your own thinking. It's still your responsibility as an individual to use your senses and your mind to observe reality and understand what's true or not. And it's still your responsibility as an individual to control your emotions and not get caught up in madnesses of crowd. But, uh, you know, uh, we've had lynch mobs. We've had all kinds of mobs in human history going back to, to, to the killing of Socrates and I'm sure thousands of years before that. And, um, yeah, people get emotional. People do stupid things when they get emotional. They, they get carried away. They don't think. They let other people do the thinking for them. Yeah. This is how authoritarians come to power. And, of course, many authoritarians come to power under the assumption that their, their consciousness can create reality, and it can't. You can't actually create your own reality. What you can do is reshape existing reality in your image. You can, you can take the material that is out there and reshape it, reconstruct it, um, and, and in that sense change the world, but you're not changing the fundamental essence of, of uh, you know, the laws of physics and the laws of existence. So. I, I think I think you have me almost convinced because you know if we ever construct an artificial AI that develops consciousness, it won't be human consciousness, right? So if we talk about consciousness in in, in a way that we've developed something and it's undeniably conscious, well, the question is, can we orient society, decide, or does society sometimes self-assemble in a way where all the nodes are in place, where there is a, a general awareness that would not be possible? or achievable with the individual nodes. So I think there's some, some room for well, debate there. But I, I love the idea that individuals are still responsible as a, as a desire. That mob madness that you said, it's interesting, right? You said mob madness. So that would mean that there is some kind of an emergence of madness that wouldn't exist with individuals. Um, well, I'm not saying that, that uh, you know, uh, groups don't have an impact on the individual. But at the end of the day, the madness is the madness of an individual who is part of a mob. But it's of the individual. You choose to be part of a mob or not to be part of a mob. You choose to let your emotions carry you away, but it's your emotions. So, um, and it's, it's, it's absolutely true that knowledge builds on other knowledge. That is, when we create networks of communication, I can learn from you, you can learn from me, we can all learn from Newton and Aristotle and all these others, and we build knowledge. Uh, you know, through communication between us. But it's still absolutely true that only I can be aware of something. A group is not aware of anything. I can be aware of something. You can be aware of something. We can both be maybe aware of the same thing or think we're aware of the same thing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make us aware. It makes each one of us as an individual aware and, and we're sharing and communication in that awareness. And I can point something out to you. I can say, look over there. Mm -hmm. And then you look, and now you're aware of what I'm aware. But you have to be aware of it. That is, it's still true that you can't, you know, we're not the Borg, uh, if you go back to, uh, what is it, Star Trek, right? Yeah. We, we don't have a collective consciousness. We yeah. only have an individual consciousness that can be directed to a particular direction. But we have to accept that direction, otherwise it doesn't happen. So. I don't get caught up in mobs by yeah. choice. This, is, this yeah. is what makes us human, right? We have a choice. But this is also true of animals. I mean, every lion has his own consciousness, right? And there's no group consciousness in lions. There's no group consciousness in any animal. Each animal has to observe reality and, in a sense, make decisions. Now, we know they don't have free wills. They don't make decisions in the same way. Decisions are made for them, but by the organism itself. Are it's you not, saying? Are you saying you know that animals don't have free will? I suspect that animals do not have free will. I suspect that 
human beings, uh, the, the great evolutionary leap that are human beings mm. is our capacity to reason, which means our capacity to think, which means free will. I don't think yeah. you can have think without free will. So it, it, evolution basically, evolution, I mean, basically said, but evolution doesn't say, but evolution of the leap was, instead of having to program us uh, with the data for every single occurrence, the programming is leaving us free to self-program. Yeah. That is what evolution allows us to do is self-program. Given a, a certain base that a biology, yeah. we get to make choices, we get to think for ourselves. I don't think yeah. other animals um, can do that, and if they can, they can only do it in a very, very, very narrow scope, whereas yeah. for human beings, that scope is wide, very wide. Okay, so so the, the people that study the, the, the pack hunting behavior of wolves have, have uh, noticed that there seems to be decision making that is um, about, you know, this part of these three wolves will go that way, those seven wolves will go this way, and we have no idea how they make that decision. Um, mm -hmm. You know, social animals who hunt tend to be far more along the lines of appearing to exhibit, uh, you know, symptoms of uh, free will, if you will. I totally believe in free will. I just want to let you know where I come from as an evolutionary biologist. And it's not through evolution that I believe in free will. It's, it's simply through empirical observation. You know, the, in the, in the end game test, the Absolutely. ultimate empirical test of free will to me is if somebody's challenging me to do something to prove that free will does not exist, all I have to do is the opposite, right? So whatever the scenario is, you know, to prove if you truly have free will, there's no human being on the planet that can put me in any scenario. That, and, and I have a funny story where I was challenged when I was an undergraduate as a, psycho, a, a psychology uh, course I was taking and uh, this professor was trying to teach me and the rest of the class about operant conditioning. And he said, you know, I can motivate any student in this class to do something right now. There's not anyone who can challenge me that tells me that you don't have free will uh, or that, that, that you have free will. And I, I said, OK, I've raised, raised my hand, of course. And he said, if you leave this class right now, I'll give you an A on the next test. So, all right, I got up, I walked out of the classroom. I stood out there for about two minutes and I went back in the classroom and sat down. <laughs> Right. So this this to me, you know, he didn't give me the A, but this to me was uh, and that's that's a that's a demerit on his part. This this to me is the kind of uh, in your face test of free will. Uh, there's another example of a neighbor of mine who was actually in in a cave prison in Nazi Germany. Uh, it was a dark. I call it a cave because it was cold and damp and dark. And she described it as as having so many layers of paint on the walls. Uh, different colors that she to brighten up the room she told me that she licked the paint away to make patterns and murals and there was a young German Nazi soldier who was about what 20 21 or something that was out there guarding her and she stood in front of this uh, came to the front of the of the um, cell and started crying and weeping and he turned around and he said you know you know, shut up, old lady. You're never gonna. You're right where we want you. You're never gonna get out of here. You're, it's over for you. There's no point in crying for yourself. And she said, "I'm not crying for me. I'm crying for you. You're a 21 year old kid, and you have to stand here guarding a cell of a little old la little lady like me. She was probably in her 30s or whatever. She was probably young in those days. Yeah. And the lesson there is that he thought he had control. They thought that they had constructed a reality." But her perception overruled, and that is where the free will comes from. We can overrule our base. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I think that fundamentally free will is the choice to engage or not, the choice to focus or not, the choice to think or not. Uh, to be or not to be really is to think or not to think, and to think or not to think is to engage, to, to, to actually do the thinking, to focus your mind. Uh, to bring it into focus. We all know you wake up, you're kind of groggy, and you're kind of unfocused. And some people stay that way the whole day. They never actually focus on anything. And, and the, the challenge as human beings is how to stay in focus and how to use our mind consistently and consciously. And I think the proof of free will is ultimately the same as the proof of anything. I mean, the, the, the proof in the end of, 
of it is is of, of anything as you point at it to you know uh, uh, this is this is a bottle of water how do we know because i can see it you know i can touch it i can i can do the bio i can do the uh, chemistry of it i can do the physics of it i you know the, my senses provide me the evidence well introspection is how we know we have free will you know that you could have stayed in that class you know I, I mean, one test of the professor is no. I'm not going to leave the class because I don't want to get an unearned exactly. A. That's why I was. Right. That's why. That's why I smile. That's why I laugh about it because if I had chose, if I whatever I chose, it was my choice, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he just so didn't. You can expect and know that yeah. any one of those options are available to you, and that you chose it, and and that is the fundamental proof. It's a, it, in that sense, it's a it's a it's a foundation for all knowledge, and it's an axiomatic concept. It's it's. We start with the with the premise that is directly observable that we engage in choices among options, and that we engage in it. That it's not just done automatically. For yeah, us. total, totally, it's a choice, including structuring our economy, structuring our society. It's all can be done consciously and awareness and it could be done collectively or it could be done by powerful individuals. So I wanted to talk with you uh, and ask you about inequality and economics. So I've heard you define and talk about um, the mixed economy. So can you talk about inequality, economics, the mixed economy, and why are you persevering on those concepts? Well, that's like a seven hour talk, but um, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what is a mixed economy? A mixed economy is a mixture of freedom and coercion. So I, I don't, I view the, the spectrum, if you will, as on one side, freedom and the other side coercion. That is, you will, the e economic spectrum, the political spectrum, the social spectrum with which we live. Freedom means no coercion, no force, no authority, authority telling me what to do. And as long as I don't use coercion against you, as long as I don't commit fraud against you, it's nobody's business. You leave me alone. Yeah, but you don't mean anarchy. You don't mean anarchy. I don't mean anarchy because you need a government to arbitrate to figure out whether I used force against you or not, right? And and to mitigate that force if I do use force. So a government that's limited to protecting us from the use of force. Yeah. That to me is freedom. Coercion is communism, fascism, uh, you know, Nazism, uh, all of those, where basically you live by permission. Everything is coerced. Everything is dictated by authority. We live in a society that's in the middle. That is, much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we think we do freely without being coerced. I mean, but the fact is, there's coercion all around us. Uh, whether it's the fact that when we go and open a bank account, the million and one forms that we have to fill are dictated by government regulation, by government force. The bank is not free to engage with us on our terms, on a, on a, a but based on government terms. When you go, you know, right now with COVID, um, if you want a vaccine, you can't get a vaccine. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't get a vaccine unless you abide by the authoritarian dictates, by the coarse dictates of some m mindless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., who are basically, you know, I would argue responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans at this point mm -hmm. because of, of how they are regulating, controlling coercion vis a vis the vaccine, let's say, or testing, or a whole variety of other things. You can't get, for example, I, there's a company in Boston that will sell me a kit uh, that, where I can test myself every day at home right. with saliva, whether I'm in, uh, you know, whether I've got a, a load of uh, COVID virus that is infectious or not, right? right? I can't buy it from that company. I will go and offer them a million dollars. They won't, they cannot sell it to me because there's coercion, there's force, there's regulation, there's controls of the FDA saying you can't sell that no matter who wants to buy it. And it, and it goes both ways both way as well. So I just want to jump in here because it was April or, or, or February or April, I was calling for private in-home testing. Yeah. Private. And, and it, the technology was available. Yep. And there is no private in-home testing. Still, it's cheap and truly in-home. And reliable. Because a government, because an authority, because somebody who uses a gun prevented it from happening. If you, if that Boston company sells me their in-home kit, they would go to jail and potentially I would go to jail. They would force you. So this is a mixed economy. Where, 
yeah, I, I can do a lot of things without asking for permission. But it turns out that there's a lot of things that somebody engaging with me and I need to ask permission for in order to execute. So that's a mixed economy. A mixed economy is the economy where we're taxed, regulated, controlled by a government, but we still have the semblance, at least, of some freedom. And you could move along the mixed economy more towards freedom mm -hmm. or more towards authoritarianism. And I, my ideal is that we move to a position where we're 100% free. We're free of all government controls, regulations, and all the dictates of, of government and dictates of our neighbors. Uh, you know, uh, everybody says, uh, says to me, but government, we are the government. No, we're not a government, right? If, if you didn't vote for the party in the, in the majority, it's not your government necessarily, right? They're not doing what you want. Plus, when I do vote, they don't ask me what to do. They go on and do whatever they want to do. So it's not our government. And even if it was, it's a government where the majority is dictating to the minority. The majority is violating the rights of the minority. So capitalism is a system. Capitalism is freedom. Capitalism is a system where the government's job is to protect individual rights, period. Protect our freedom, period. And everything else is different forms of statism. We're on the way to authoritarianism in some kind of mixed economy, but authoritarianism is right there around the corner. So that was one question you asked. Um, I think this is crucial, right? Why do I talk about it all the time? Because it's about freedom. It's, 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 if we're going to talk about politics, it's the only important question to ask. Uh, you know, are we less free? Are we more free? Is this bill that they're proposing going to lead to more freedom or less freedom? Is this action of the president going to lead us to more freedom or less freedom? What else is there? Everything else is is nonsense. And 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 the problem is nobody talks about freedom anymore. Not on the right and not on the left. And that's why, by the way, you started out with me rejecting both life, right and left because I view today both right and left as being uh, either mixed or authoritarian. Both. I'm neither one of those. I'm not mixed. I'm not, and I'm not in the center because I don't know what the center is between these two authoritarian poles. Exactly. I'm in a different dimension. I'm in a completely That's different right. dimension. I'm in a dimension of capitalism, individualism, in a dimension of freedom. And until we start thinking of politics in terms of individualism over here, collectivism over here, in other yeah. words, authoritarianism. Yeah, you nailed it. That was my next question because people on the left always think that Ayn Rand was far right they describe nope. her as far right because they think everybody that's not liberal must be far right they only see one dimension as i read her she's far more about individual rights versus collectivism rather than liberal versus conservative so i'm glad that you nailed that that was fantastic she denounced the conservatives and she denounced the left she denounced both right and left in her time there's an old sense in which right meant individual rights freedom but that's gone trump laid that one to rest. There, there is no relation between the right and individual rights. And conservatives have laid that to rest because they're not advocate of individual rights, certainly not on social issues, for example. Um, but so the spectrum is different. The spectrum is statists and collectivists over there, individualists over here. And I'm on an individual side. Uh, so I, I have enemies, vast numbers of enemies who are both leftists and on the right. You're right okay. in the middle. That, Each that, one accused me of being on the other side. <laughs> That's exactly where I am, right? And so, you know, it, it, people t tend to forget. You mentioned that Trump proved that there's no um, individual rights uh, that are protected by the right. Well, he he came in as a Democrat running for president and then switched parties. So if he's not, he is not the right. I mean, there, there, uh, people are going to hate me for this because I know there are people that love what he well, said, not said that he stood up for. Yeah. Go ahead. He's not for individualism, but he turns out that he is the right. If the right, right is associated with the Republican Party, is the right associated with religion and Americans who stand for particular ideas, they say they're for the Constitution, even though they have no idea what it means, then he is, he is the right. He had 75 million people who self-identify as being on the right, voted for Donald Trump. So... Um, he is the right. That's why I reject both right and left, because I reject both Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton yeah. and George Bush and all of them going back about 100 years. I mean, the last president I liked was Calvin Coolidge. 
<laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. So, uh, so they both want both sides now want big government. Neither one of yep. them is like okay. We're, you know what we need is less government and uh, people that say like in California, uh, they they want more powerful, increasing more power in the government. More we need to be governed as opposed to you know perhaps government should be a public service and a public good, not. A power regulation control thing so I get all that but what happens you know I know you're all for deregulation corporations should be free disband regulatory agencies don't proliferate them you, you know you, you um, don't want to you, you want to limit the government's ability to control business but you don't want to just limit it you want to abolish it you think that there shouldn't be just a limit so I'm happy to hear, I was very happy to hear you call for the end to the Department of Health and Human Services. All right. But what about right now? What do we, how do we talk about it, Yaron, when, when there's deregulation to the point where there's regulatory capture? When the com corporations become so powerful and they figured out and they game the system that they send their people in, uh, where you know, the, the EPA, CDC, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I have a very specific, very point pointed question which is um think of, I, I think about it this way the, the the income of government is limited by taxation or it should be right should some be. of well, some of these regulatory agencies have not for profits like the, the nih and the cdc they print money. Right? And, and the government can print money remember so right. it's not limited to taxation in the conventional sense well, well whatever well, let's think about the big bowl of money that's printed so the government's access to that right is theoretically limited by taxation in contrast to the income of corporations which is theoretically limited by market availability of revenue sure. demand so when they capture a regulatory agency the risk then becomes that they can do coerced consumption yeah. such as you know, I, I agree so so isn't the solution to that get rid of the regulatory agency and there's nothing to capture I mean, that's the solution. Yeah. So as long as government intervenes in business, business will intervene in government. Yeah. Because government is a gun forcing business to behave in a particular way. So I'll give you an example. There's a number of them, but I'll give you one example. Uh, government for the last five years has been making noises about Facebook. They want to regulate Facebook. They want to control Facebook. They don't like what Facebook's doing on privacy, on speech, on, on the way it runs its business. It's a monopoly. It's whatever. So they bring Zuckerberg in time after time, and these ignorant buffoons, mm. who we call senators and congressmen, I apologize, but it's infuriating, sit there and, and shake their finger at one of the great entrepreneurs uh, in American history who's created tr billions and billions of dollars of wealth and has improved m most of our lives, those of us who use Facebook uh, rationally, let's put it that way. Um, and, and they, they accuse him of all kinds of stuff. What's he supposed to do? Is he supposed to just sit on his hands and wait for the government to come and tell him how he should run his business, which is going to happen? Uh, they've already filed an antitrust lawsuit against him, right? Or what he is doing is he's saying, okay, I sh if, if they're going to come after me anyway, if they're going to try to dictate uh, my speech codes and all of that, why don't I come up with some regulatory ideas and try to get them to adopt mine because it's good for my shareholders and it's good for mine. Well, of course he will. So, but the only way to stop that, and I don't blame him one second for that because he's, he's acting in self-defense, but the only way to stop that is basically, I mean, I don't know why Congress should ever invite a businessman in front of them unless there's an accusation of fraud on the table, which for some bizarre reason the FBA or the authorities can't deal with. But why should Congress ever have a businessman in front of them? What is it that Congress can add to our understanding of business, to our knowledge of business? Uh, nothing. So I would like to see government separated from economics. I'd like to see government have no economic policy, no regulations, no uh, antitrust. And then business has no interest in dealing with government. And, and there's a famous case. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this story. I've told it in many of my lectures. In, uh, in the mid-1990s, 19, mid Microsoft was the largest corporation in the world. It, it incredibly productive, incredibly innovative, and it was, had the largest market cap of any company in the world. And it basically spent every year on lobbying in Washington, D.C., 
zero dollars, literally zero. No lawyers, no lobbyists, no building in DC, no presence in the nation's capital, none, largest company in the world. And Owen Hatch, who at the uh, is still a senator, Republican, by the way, from uh, Utah, brought them in in front of some committee and he brought the Microsoft executives. And they were, you know, they, they, were, they were accused of all kinds of things, being a monopoly, being all kinds of things. And at some point, Owen Hatch stood up and he yelled at them and he said, you guys need to have a presence in Washington, D.C. You guys need to lobby. You yeah. need yeah. to be here, right? Yeah. In other words, you need to bribe me. That's what he was saying. Microsoft said, literally, the executive said, we see no reason to do it. You leave us alone. We promise to you leave you alone. And they went back home to, uh, to uh, I forget the neighborhood outside of Seattle, right? Uh, six months later, six months later, Justice Department comes knocking on their door. Mm. We're here to sue you for antitrust violations. By the way, what was the antitrust infringement that they committed? They were offering a product for free, <laughs> Internet Explorer. Mm -hmm. And that is a massive, you know, competitive. How can yeah. you offer a product for free? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, they bundling and it went on. And then basically the government destroyed Microsoft. And for well over 10 years, Microsoft was a shell of itself. It's only in the last few years as the government left have they, have they resurrected uh, Microsoft. That is what happens when government intervenes and business has no choice. What are you supposed to do when somebody with a gun tells you, behave, well, I'm going to try to capture you. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to get you to do what I say. And, and um, it, it, the harm that this does is, is truly, you know, truly unbelievable. And, and again, I, I think the vaccines right now are exa a great example of this. And if you want, we can. I, well, can, I can tell you a story about vaccines. Well, we'll get to that. I'll bring, I'll bring that back up. But I wanted to explore the following thought that um, <clears throat> the, the, we talked earlier about controlling ourselves, controlling our base instincts, right? This cognition. And the, the at least the justification that was given for regulation was that people were selling snake oil, FDA, people were putting fillers in foods and this kind of thing. And in a free market economy, there's going to be people that that cheat. There's you know there's going to be people that load the system and game it in their favor, and um, so I think that there's a natural. I'm not defending regulation by any means, but I think that w to avoid coerced consumption, such as near universality of GMO crops, which leads to pesticide universal pesticide consumption, you're forced to eat pesticides because the GMO actually grows better. I mean, this is this is to me a form of coercion. I don't have a choice, and I don't know that I don't have a choice. You know, I don't know that I don't have a choice to eat this type of corn or that kind. Of, Mexico just outlawed GMO, so Mexican corn is going to go huge in the United States. It's going to be a, a a real commodity. It's going to be a specialty. So you see, cheating in the market, and 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 you you it spikes. You know, you, you, there's regulation against in medicine and all the rest. But when corporates take over government and they do things like make a liability free vaccine program where you can't sue them for any damages to vaccines, and they have no incentive to fix their product. They've short circuited that natural cycle. That just reinforces my point. I mean, if, if you don't, why is the government involved with vaccines? If the government had zero involvement in vaccines, it wouldn't give them a liability uh, uh, free, and then you'd have a free market in vaccines, and I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. But, but I, I mean, it's ridiculous. what you're saying about GMO is just untrue. First of all, I'm a huge fan of GMO. I love GMOs. I love genetic engineering of all kinds. I, I think it's the future, and, and uh, I can't wait until they are able to actually you know, improve us, not just the food that we eat. But beyond that, it, it, let's imagine a free market. Wait, 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 wait. You said they can improve us. Who's they? Well, whoever innovates and discovers the ways to modify the human genome. I mean, uh, and they will offer it as a product, and we will make choices about what we want to do with that. But the point is that, and, and if they can eradicate diseases that way, and they can eradicate our, our inclination to cancer that way, and if you eradicate all kinds of things that way, yeah. I, I think that's, that's uh, phenomenal. But uh, take GMO. So assume that Monsanto is doing this GMO stuff and this G now is there anybody who has an incentive to educate you 
about, let's say GMO is bad, which I don't buy the premise, but let's say it is. It's not is the anybody... GMO, it's the pesticides, but go ahead. But let, let's, okay, so pesticides. Let's assume the pesticides are bad. And, and who has an incentive to educate you about the, and there's no, there's no FDA as if the FDA educates you about anything, but there's no FDA, there's no government. Who then has an incentive to, to educate you about non-pesticide grown food? Well, the organic farmers. And organic farmers might want to create a union so they can leverage size in order to do a marketing campaign. And they might go to uh, John Mackey and say, hey, uh, you own Whole Foods. How, how, how about we do seminars at Whole Foods about the value of, uh, of, and would you fund maybe a journal or maybe a newspaper article once a month where we tell the people about the beauty of organic. I mean, that's a free market. A free market is where we let ideas out there. I less concerned about pesticides let's say uh, than maybe you are and and maybe I'm wrong maybe you're right you know that's that's a scientific discussion right, right, right. I are less concerned about pesticide prefer the cheap pesticide filled food you are willing to pay a premium for organic food and the market segments like that based on information that's provided by the different vendors who are trying to yes now is there gonna be fraud in the market of course is there fraud today of course, the difference is this. The fraud today is done on a much grander scale because the primary fraud that is committed today is committed by the government. So I don't know if, how familiar you are with the food pyramid. There's a food pyramid that the government releases telling us what food is healthy and what food is not. Right. And for the last 40 years, they've told us that saturated fat from meat is like poison and, and, and a disaster. So avoid fat and eat lots of grains. Grains are great. Fat is bad, which has caused potentially, I mean, this is again a scientific question, but one side would argue that it has caused the obesity crisis that we have today in America. That actually, if you eat good saturated fat, it's good for you, it fills you up, you eat less, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, uh, carbohydrates turn into sugar and cause diabetes, which leads to all kinds of problems. And But that's fraud on a huge scale in a sense that's I couldn't where more, you'd yeah. get competition yeah. you'd have different dietitians presenting different offerings yeah. and we as individuals would be we'd be using our minds rather than letting somebody else some bureaucrat use his mind in replacing ours and we'd each make decisions about what we think appropriate diet is some of us would be mistaken so there's always fraud I, I give you one other example from a, from a market that I'm familiar with finance right Bernie Madoff, you remember Bernie Madoff? Of course, yeah. Largest pyramid scheme in, in, in history? Yep. Well, Bernie Madoff did it under the nose of the SEC, under the nose of probably a dozen different regulatory agencies. The SEC was, was told about Bernie Madoff's pyramid scheme by a, another hedge fund who sent them a thick report about what Bernie Madoff was doing or not doing mm -hmm. three times. They actually sent investigators into Bernie Madoff's offices, and they thought he was clean. Hmm. And yet, so the market, this hedge fund, had identified the fraud that Bernie Madoff had committed. SEC couldn't, and it took one of his sons to actually go to the SEC and tell them before the SEC brought him to justice. So I think the markets are far better at catching fraudsters, but hmm. if if the SEC has any job, it should be to catch fraudsters. Yeah. So I'm fine with the government devoting resources to catching people who commit fraud, who sell snake oil, who sell tests that don't actually test, or sell vaccines that don't actually vaccinate. So that's, that's what that's incredible. So I've actually found not, a spot where you said that some regulation is is no, but this is not regulation. Oh, this is okay. fraud. Laws against fraud have existed okay. since the beginning of, of common law, certainly for a thousand years. Okay. You don't need massive government systems for that. It's not a preemptive law. It doesn't say you can't distribute a vaccine. It says once you distribute the vaccine, if we discover that you have lied in its distribution, then we could sue you for fraud. Uh, that's a completely different system than what we have today. And it's not regulation. It's not intervention. This is basic law to protect individual rights you don't have a right to defraud another human being and again that has always existed so um but again i believe that there's a lot less fraud a lot less fewer mistakes 
a lot fewer errors in a free market than there are in a government regulated environment. But uh, one more example. Yeah. If, if, um, if you're a food producer, who do you fear more in terms of inspections? The FDA or the supermarket? Because you know supermarkets send their own private inspectors into food processing plants and into farms. If you're if you're a big food right. producer, you're gonna, you're not going to be afraid of the FDA because you own the FDA. That's the problem. And, and you can always right. bribe the FDA guy. I mean, yeah. how much does he make? But the fa and he, if he gets it wrong, would he lose his job? No. But if the private inspector gets it wrong, will he lose his job? Absolutely, and probably be liable, and probably be sued, and he's got huge capital involved. So imagine if the FDA was private and had there were multiple FDAs and they competed with one another. Nice. to provide information and guidance to the marketplace. Imagine if, if th those regulatory agencies that are needed in order to provide information to consumers were private. You know, you know why when you plug an electronic into the wall, it doesn't blow up and kill you? Well, partially because it turns out that manufacturers have figured out that it's not a good idea to kill their own customers. That's part so that's it. one strong incentive. But second, <laughs> there is a private entity that actually certifies all electric products, yeah, the not a government, yeah. private entity. Yeah. So we don't need government to do this. And indeed, what government does when it when it does this is it, it, it kills people. Right? And that's what the FDA does. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people die every year, maybe millions, because of the, the fact that they don't allow the use of certain drugs because they've made drug discovery so expensive um, and because they, you know, they, 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 they prohibit us from getting a vaccine that was developed months and months and months ago, and we could have been over this whole thing a long time ago. Yeah. So assuming the vaccine actually could do this for this particular type of virus, but uh, so I agree with well, all of that. We, and let the vaccine, so, let the so, virus evolve, then it won't be able to stop it. But if right, we've done so, it in the summer, yeah, yeah. it'll be it will be over by now. Yeah, maybe that's an arguable point. I think you're, I, 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 I would hope to think that, that that would be true. So let me just say everything that you just talked about, Yaron, I, I totally agree with you to the point where I actually published a peer-reviewed article called Plan B that takes HHS and it makes HHS irrelevant because now it is funded by the government, but it's funded by the government in a, in a manner that is not touchable by corporations. Right, so the corporatism to me is ten thousand times worse than having a, a, a FDA because if if every no, industry, no, no. no, if every industry, I'm not arguing that FDA is good. I'm saying it's horrible. I'm saying that the the, reg, the regulation is horrible, but corporatism, corporate corporations getting into these regulatory agencies and owning them, games the system so bad that they start persecuting people for fraud that's not fraud. Then we I have agree a problem, with right? But again, you're, you're, you're using the term corporatism, which is the wrong term. It's cronyism. But okay. the corporatism plays the corporation. It places the blame on the corporation. The blame is on the regulatory agency. I think if corporations were left alone, yeah. then, then they would things leave the, would be... Then they would leave the regulations. Right? Well, yeah, we're in total agreement. Yeah. Well, there would be no regulations. That's my point. Yeah, yeah. And the only way to end cronyism is to get rid of the regulations. As long as the regulations, there will always be people trying to influence them. And by the way, it's not just corporations. It's unions. I mean, look at yeah, teachers. Sure. Look at the teachers' unions. They're completely corrupt and destroyed education. Yeah. Uh, it, it's all kinds of pressure groups that gang up together to go to Washington to try to influence because Washington is in their lives. Now, if Washington got out of education, if the government got out of education, yeah then you would have far better education, far cheaper education, and and you wouldn't have this the unions involved in education because there would be no teachers union. Not yeah, at the scale you, that you, your that. comments bring to bring to mind a book uh, called The Drug Story by Morris Alice and Beale. Have you read the drug story? No, I haven't. That's a that's a definite recommendation. What we see here is a history where uh, corporations banded together to say all right we're going to have regulation it's coming what are we going to do about it and what we need to do is we need to own this from stem to stern so we're going to run this government and uh, that's what i mean by corporatism when the court is and you, you said it, you said it you said it wait, hang on hang on you're on you said it earlier when you said the left 
the left form uh, appreciates a form of economics that's a type of fascism. That's exactly what yep. you're talking about. So, right? so if you have it's corporate fascism. interest and government oh, interest working together, they need to be kept. They need to be kept totally apart. They need to be separate. No, I don't separate. mind them working together. I have no problem with collusion uh, between corporations. <laughs> corporations right. and government get together. It's what's scary. And again, yeah. I and this I can't emphasize this enough because it's so crucial. The origin of the problem is always government. I mean, the same thing. Why do we have a Federal Reserve today? And, and why are banks so involved in the Federal Reserve? Well, in 1913, it was clear to the big bankers in New York that the government was going to take over their business, that the government was going to establish a central bank that was going to dominate banking. People don't know, before 1914, we had no central bank. And things were fine in terms of finance. Indeed, I, I would argue much better in terms of finance without a central bank. But we, we, they knew it was coming. So what did they do? Well, they said, if it's going to come, we want to have a part in writing the laws that make it a reality. And they got together with politicians and they tried to influence them. Now, I have to admit, I prefer the corporations run regulatory agencies than politicians running regulatory agencies. Now, I prefer that nobody run regulatory agencies that they just don't exist. But if I had to choose between Bernie Sanders, Ted Cruz, AOC, uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump running a regulatory agency, or CEOs of corporations. I'll take the CEOs of corporations. They're smarter. They're more productive. Uh, they know how markets actually work. They know something about the world. Uh, but I don't want either one of them. I want regulatory agencies into the trash bin of history where they belong. Thank you for that. So I heard you compliment a politician. I can't remember her name uh, on her argument that we can't really... Uh, justify massive spending, not spending and prioritizing education, prioritizing health care for the poor, Obamacare, because we can afford it. What was that politician's name? I can't remember who you're talking about. Um, Wait, it was AOC. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't remember her name for some reason. So, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. But, but here's the thing: I, I, you said that that was a winning argument. You said, "Listen, she's won the argument on moral grounds." I don't, I'm not saying you're, I'm not saying you agree with her. I'm not saying you agree with her. All right, I'm not saying you agree with her. But you said she had the winning argument in the in the public square, where most people are going to believe it. But don't we have to factor in the externalized costs of healthcare, the insurance scam, the expenses of? The, we have the sickest generation ever, with over 54 percent of people under 20 have chronic lifelong illnesses that require pharmaceutical products. Uh, after we've invested so much in healthcare, how is that? You know, is that really a winning argument? What about externalizing costs? And I want to go there with respect to what I call good money versus bad money. Well, I'd say we've been external. We've been externalizing costs for the last fifty years. Certainly since the since Medicare and Medicaid, we've nationalized healthcare. At least fifty one percent before Obamacare, maybe close to sixty percent today. Mm -hmm. uh, we regulate insurance companies. I mean, this idea of insurance fraud is, is absurd. The, it's, there's no insurance fraud because there's no insurance. Well, we have a products created by the state. This is fascism. Where we pretend that insurance companies are selling them. But it's, at, you know, in the state of California, uh, what is included in a, in a policy, and this is Obamacare as well, what's included in a health insurance policy is not determined by the insurance company. It's not determined by me negotiating with the insurance company. It's determined by the state who then tells the insurance company this is what you can sell so mm -hmm. i want to get rid of the externalities and the only way to get rid of the externalities is to privatize them and the way to privatize them is to make individuals bear the cost of their own behavior so if a lot of americans are sick because of their own behavior well they should pay higher health care costs than i do i try to take care of myself why should I say, pay exactly the same on health insurance as they do? Shouldn't there be a premium for being healthy? Shouldn't they be able to adjust, for example, right? I don't want to pay for other people's health care, right, through the government and through subsidies and through controls. I don't want to pay, pay for things that I don't want to use. So, for example, when I buy a health insurance policy in California, I pay for maternity, but I'm not going to have any more kids. Yeah. Done that. Can't, even if I wanted to. Um, I pay for acupuncture. I don't want acupuncture. I've tried it. It doesn't work for me. I don't want to have to pay for that service to be I, uh, mental illness. All these things. I don't want them. Of course, right? Maybe it's a mistake. Right. Maybe I should have them. But that's my problem. Yeah. I, I shouldn't be able to socialize that to other people. So the solution 
to healthcare is not to keep loading it up in terms of externalities, to keep creating more and more externalities, but to eliminate the externalities by privatizing it. And the only way to do that is to get rid of Medicaid, phase it out, to get Medicaid phase it out, and to allow insurance companies to offer all kinds of products, including products that are customized to poor people, and maybe have insurance against pre-existing conditions, which is an interesting concept, but which I think would evolve in a marketplace. Yep. And you could create a lot of, if you're creative enough, and the market's amazingly creative, we could create products that would ensure everybody in the United States would privatize the cost, would reduce the cost of healthcare dramatically, because that's what markets do. They increase quality and reduce uh, cost. Instead, we've got a bloated, bureaucratic, ineffectual, inefficient, uh, healthcare system in which doctors have become bureaucrats. They have checklists. You come in with a particular disease. They say, "Okay, I have to give you this. Uh, let's see how you respond." Okay, then this. They don't. They don't try to customize the healthcare to you. The whole dream. You remember the dream of personalized medicine? I was in it. Medicine yep. customized you to your genetics to everything. That's out the window. That doesn't exist anymore. We now have collectivized medicine, group medicine. Uh, and thinking medicine, and that's because we try to copy the Europeans who, who've had that for decades now. Yeah. So no, it's healthcare is a disaster, and and it's going to become a bigger disaster the the more we emphasize uh, the collectives, the more that we emphasize the that part. This that is what I love about you, Yaron, because you're so self consistent. Because these same people that are looking at the free market for the medicine that's right for them would then also be free of the perception disruptions, the distorted perception of the, what's healthy for them and their food, you know, in terms of their diet, because the FDA has kicked out all of it. So this is why I wanted you here. We got more to talk about, but, uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate your position on uh, the difference between globalists and, you know, global. Uh, well, there is uh, something as a globalist. Globalist is what right. Ayn Rand called an anti-concept. Right, exactly. This is what I'm saying, that the concept of globalism versus, look, we live in a, we live in a world. There has to be global in, uh, economics. There has to be trade. Uh, but nevertheless, a lot of people are concerned in the United States about the Great Reset, especially people on the right. They, they don't like the idea, I think, that, you know, the idea out there, that somebody out there that doesn't answer to us, it doesn't answer to us, they're not our representatives, they don't answer to us because they're not our neighbor, they're uh, beyond our borders. That they're basically going to broker a shitty deal for Americans, and you know, is that your take? That you know, is it feasible? Is it even feasible to do what Klaus is talking about? You know, a future where we own nothing and, and everybody's happy about that? Is it? No, of course not. I mean, uh, if, if we own nothing, then everybody's miserable and poor, and and the population of the world shrinks to probably half a billion. So so ninety percent of us disappear off the face of the earth. We all die. So Klaus is. Uh, delusional. He's a fascist in his inclinations. I mean, it's deep down real fascism. He's dangerous. But my problem with the Great Reset is not that it comes from Europe. My problem with the Great Reset are the ideas that they're presenting. Mm -hmm. I don't care if the authoritarian who's going to implement these ideas is American. I'm not a patriot when it comes to bad ideas. I mean, bad ideas, bad ideas, are evil ideas. I don't care what your origin, color, skin, uh, sexual orientation. Uh, it doesn't matter. Bad ideas yeah. are bad ideas. So exactly. I, House's bad ideas come packaged with a German accent, which makes them worse, <laughs> sound worse, right? Yeah. But that's good because maybe when people hear it, they associate it with the kind of Germans that we should fear. But it's not his it's not the fact that it's coming from europe it's the fact that there are many people in america who support the great reset who believe that the great reset is legitimate i mean the entire american left is today dedicated to many of the propositions of the great reset so i oppose them wherever they come from and i think the right instead of focusing on the content is creating some conspiracy theory about Klaus wants to control the world. Klaus is 70 something years old. He's never, oh, maybe 80 something years old. He's not gonna control the world. He's not gonna be global dictator. Who cares about what Klaus thinks? What I care about is the fact that intellectually, because what drives the world are ideas, intellectually Klaus is having an impact on intellectuals in America. Yeah. What I worry about 
are the Harvard, Yale, Princeton professors who agree with Klaus, mm -hmm. who are influencing policy in Washington every single day. And we see that in the first days of the Biden administration, you're already seeing. Um, they're going to talk nonstop about inequality. They're going to talk nonstop about climate change. And they're going to engage in policies that are destructive to individual liberty and individual freedom. They're going to engage in policies that are destructive to prosperity and to economic growth. And that's what's upsetting. Not, I mean, most of people in America don't know this, but most of the ideas that the founders had when they made a, created America were, God forbid, don't tell anybody this, were European ideas. <laughs> they, you know, they were reading because hey, they were all they all originally came from you, but they were reading John Locke, and they were reading Montesquieu, and yeah. a lot of the ideas, God forbid, were French, yeah. right? Montesquieu, <laughs> Voltaire, the, the French encyclopedists, the Enlightenment, and Scottish, French and Scottish. I mean, God, this country was created on French. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm going to get banned from YouTube because you're you're celebrating Western culture. How dare you? So yeah, Western culture, yeah, the yeah. only culture that's ever been really created. It, it just happens to, it has nothing to do with skin color or with gen, genes. It just happens to be the geography where people came up with good ideas. And anywhere in the world that embraces these ideas of reason and individualism prospers in those parts of the world that don't, including yeah, they, they, the West. They went through that process. That's the thing. It's that Western culture came through a process of considered debate. And, and, and they wrote it down. And, and, and it's very straightforward. I mean, the well, closest, they got lucky. They got lucky. In the, <laughs> well, maybe we'll see. But, the, origin, the origins of good ideas are, are Greece, right? and who knows yeah. who, who the Greeks were? But but the Greeks, yeah. I mean, they they invented, discovered philosophy. They started debating. They had these debates, ideological debates, and 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 uh, those ideas, both philosophical, aesthetic, were the cornerstone of civilization. You you had civilization like Mesopotamia and Egypt, but those were all dead end civilizations they went nowhere they were in the end death worshiping civilization the first civilization to, to 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 worship man to worship life to worship human beings was the greek civilization it's no accident the greek gods are like human beings with all the same tendencies as human beings and and the two main thinkers in greek were plato and aristotle and and that influenced rome and it allowed rome to thrive and when rome fell i would argue primarily because they abandoned many of the Greek ideas, embraced hedonism and Christianity. When Rome fell, those ideas disappeared, and we went into a dark ages, which was dark, until those ideas were rediscovered by, by Thomas Aquinas and others that brought them into the Catholic Church and resurrected. And that's why we have something called the Renaissance. The Renaissance is the rebirth of civilization. The rebirth of which civilization? The Renaissance of what? Of Greece. Yeah. That's what we discovered. They discovered Greek art and Greek writings and Greek philosophy, and that led, that led to the to uh, the scientific revolution, to the Enlightenment, and the creation of America. Um, but the, the Arabs, for example, just as an aside, the Arabs discovered Greece before the Christians did. They discovered Greece in around 900 AD. And they had a thriving civilization for two, three hundred years. They were into uh, medicine and, and science, and they did amazing things. And then they decided to abandon Greece. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally, uh, uh, the, 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 the brightest philosopher, a guy named Al Ghazali, went to the, the desert. You know, they were struggling with this idea of reason versus faith. And he comes back from the desert and he says, I've got the solution to the problem of reason versus faith, how to integrate them. He says, You can't. And therefore, we must abandon faith, reason, and embrace faith. And within 100 years, the libraries are gone, the civilization is in decay, <laughs> so I, and the Muslim world is where it is today because they chose faith over reason. Yeah, um, so, so, so we're so lucky. That's a, and, and, you know, that's, a beautiful, that's a beautiful representation of actual history. And what I love about what you do is you're not advocating for adoption. You're just saying this, this is the facts. This is subjectivism. So I, I want to take you down a slightly a, a, a small journey here for the American public that really doesn't know what's happening to our own culture, if you would. Uh, in the 1960s, for instance, if you're born, you grow up in a family, you have a mom and a dad, some siblings, you know, you go to school. Around that time, you actually learn as an individual developmentally, I can leave home. I can actually go associate with people outside of my family. So then 
while you're at school, you basically learned you can associate with anybody you want. You some people you can't, you don't associate with. You know, you get cliques and all the rest. You might play team sports, learn competition, learn compliance. This is where all this comes from, how we socialize our kids. And you grow up, you leave home. In college, you actually can choose which groups to you want to join and this kind of thing. So, but then you graduate, you get married, and then you say, all right, I'm going to marry this corporation. That's if you're born in the 1960s. I'm going to get a job. This is my career. I have it for the rest of my life. But nowadays, the social ties are so fluid. They're less permanent. There's no assurances. There's no contracts. What do you think the effects of this lockdown culture is going to be on personal social development? Where is the American culture going to be by all this isolation and the, the resulting sociological dynamics of society? What's that going to do to people? Well, first, I think we're lucky that it happened now versus happened in the 1950s because now because of technology and other other things, we can actually work at home and we can actually uh, do stuff and, and stay productive. And now, I don't think we would have had lockdowns in the 1950s because uh, the American people wouldn't have tolerated it back then. It says a lot about the American culture that we tolerate lockdowns and we're willing to accept them. The government tells us to stay home even though we're healthy. I mean, how authoritarian can you get? You can't get much more authoritarian than that. So lockdowns are, are something Americans wouldn't have tolerated 50 years ago. But, uh, you know, given that we have lockdowns, at least we have technology and we have the ability to communicate. We have ability uh, uh, to uh, engage in, in productive careers and, and, and to advance. Uh, you know, I don't know sociologically what will be. I, I, I don't think that's the problem. I, I think the problem of the lockdowns is much more uh, political in the lessons we learn from it. I think, I think we, we are gravitating towards more authoritarianism, more mindlessness, more uh, being willing to be told what to do kind of culture. I actually like the fact that uh, people are not don't have one career in their life. They might have several. I've had four or five um, that, that were much more fluid, that were much more flexible, that, that life is more interesting. Uh, the, the man in the gray flannel suit is a, is a famous movie about kind of the corporate man and uh, I'm, I'm glad there aren't many of those. I'm glad that at IBM you still don't have to wear a particular suit with a particular tie, with a particular shirt. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the code's a little looser. So uh, there's, I, I actually think in, that, in those senses, in a sense of how we've evolved in terms of careers, things are a lot better. Um, today, think about employees today in Silicon Valley who um, change jobs every three years. Not because they're forced to, but because, hey, they find something even better. They're, right. they're, they're experimenting. Right. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. I view it as beautiful. So I think sociologically, I think the problems have more to do with uh, are people willing to think for themselves? Are people willing to take responsibility for their own lives? And I think throughout our society, we're seeing people saying no, that they want to be taken care of, that they want somebody else to take care of. I mean, you're seeing that with the stimulus package after stimulus package after stimulus package and checks right. written and, and just massive amounts of government spending to give people stuff rather than uh, to leave people free to create their own stuff, which is which what America has always been about. So so that is, I, you know, that is what I worry about. I worry about this, uh, this increased dependency that we see among Americans. Yeah, with the dependency comes compliance, right? So, oh my gosh, I have to have my, I have to have my monthly minimum income. If I don't have my monthly minimum income, how am I going to live? Well, you don't realize well, it, you could live on your own resources and smarts. Being alive. And, yeah. Just, yeah. Just being alive. You should go just, get a check. just go for it. Yeah. yeah we, we used to think you had to produce in order to get a check. But now that's gone. The government can print the money and give it to me. Yeah, that's true. It's off the that gold is, standard. That is the real damage of this, this coronavirus. Yeah. Never mind the 400,000 lives that the government said were lost. But, but, there, but beyond that, it's going to be this idea that we don't have to work in order to get stuff. We, we, and we're compliant. We just, the government tells us to wear a mask. When we're at the beach, we wear a mask at the beach. We, we, the government tells us to, to wear a mask while we're running outdoors. We wear a mask while we're running outdoors. The government yeah. says, just stay home. Don't go anywhere. We just stay home. We don't go anywhere. Exactly. We, you know, Americans used to be the people of don't tread on me, exactly. of, 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 of defiance, of, of individualism. That is what we've lost during COVID. I, 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 could, I couldn't agree. The, 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 the gift from the government is your compliance. And, uh, you, you know, you, looking at kids and young adults today with hap what's happening politically, uh, yeah. I was shocked at, at, at how quickly things got so bad 
because people are so pent up, they have all this pent up rage about loss of control of their life because of coronavirus, and they're just scapegoating the other party. So these young, right, I think that's really happening. A young, what people are learning is that power affords you a double standard. You, if you're in power, you're right. Might makes right. And, uh, but it's you know, all about power. And of course, that is a consequence of government controlling so many aspects of a life because they are power. So everything is politicized now. Everything is about political power. And, the, and, and the battle is not about creating products. It's not about producing. It's not about building. It's about controlling. I unfortunately am. No, no, it's, it's, it's all good. I wanted to give you time if you had to get to your vaccine story, and then we're out. Well, I mean, I'll do this quick because I have another meeting that just started. Um, okay. I'll just say, you know, I don't know if, uh, how many of the listeners know this, but the vaccine, the Moderna vaccine for COVID was, uh, was uh, uh, worked out in mid-January of last year, two days after the Chinese released the genome of the virus, uh, released it unofficially because uh, the, the guy who released it was then sh a barred from his own lab because the Chinese government didn't want to do it. So, but that's a whole other story about China. But there was the genome of the vaccine was released in mid January by the Chinese by a Chinese researcher. Moderna, within a weekend, that weekend, had developed a vaccine, yep. sent it off to its manufacturing plant. By I think it was late April, early May, they had vaccines ready to go. Yeah. Then they had to abide by FDA regulations which had to extend this all the way. And then in November, so we could have been vaccinated in April, May, right? And now I wouldn't have vaccinated everybody. I would have said, look, this is an untested vaccine. We don't know what the side effects are going to be exactly. It's safe. We did phase one trials, and it looks like it's safe, but we haven't done this on mass numbers of people. But if you want to, mm -hmm. you can be a guinea pig. You can come in and you do it, and there's a contract, and maybe the contract is where you get the exclusion for liability. And I, my guess is the thousands, maybe millions of people would have been vaccinated. We would have had a mass test. We would have seen if it works. We would have seen if there were side effects on large numbers of people, right? Maybe some people, maybe a bad vaccine would have been there, and some people would have got real bad side effects. Maybe a few would have died. But, you know, the alternative is how many people have died since then from COVID? Again. Yeah. Yeah, part, mean, of the, part of the mix there, I know you got to run, but part of the mix there is that CDC botched their test in April. Uh, yes, I didn't even yeah. get to that, to the botched CDC yeah, yeah. test. Right, well, listen, they didn't make a private tech to develop a test. All of this is just justification for why government should be hands off. But listen, medicine. people, if you don't agree with Yaron Brook, so far find his channel on youtube you have another podcast coming up that you're going to launch soon what's that what's the name of that new podcast well i i'm not ready to do that but yeah oh, okay. but i encourage you to find you on well, find, him, find the yaron brooks show on youtube and get schooled on how to say what you already think i couldn't endorse this man more thank you so much i really appreciate you being right. here it was fun thank you yeah thanks